James just mentioning the Battle of Kohima in 1944, the famous battle of well, a party which was fought literally across tennis courts. The Gurkhas, of course, took part in that battle, as did other units from the Indian Army. When the fight was finally over and the uh, bloodied survivors, it's been a, a terrible fight, a sustained and terrible fight, high, uh, tremendous levels of casualties on both sides. As they came down from the hill, there were two queues, there were two nappies, <coughs> one for Indian Army and one for British Army. And the starched matrons, the ladies, as they were serving the tea, as the Gurkhas were queuing in the British queue, very British this, uh, one of them said, uh, oh no, surely Gurkhas should queue with the Indian Army. To which a Tommy sergeant replied, oh no, pet, no, no, them's Gurkhas, them's us. So the Gurkhas were recognised, indeed long have been recognised, as part of the British Army. Not just part of the British Army, but effectively as British. Which in many ways is remarkable because the land which they come from, the country of Nepal, is very, very different to Britain. Nepal, in the early period of history, prehistory and uh, medieval period, was a patchwork of very, very small uh, city-states or town-states spread out along the Kathmandu Valley. The town of Gurkha itself is 15 miles north of Kathmandu. And the Gurkhas, as it was, as it was then pronounced, uh, were just one of these very small independent, quasi-independent principalities. And the great Durbar at Gurkha, the town, uh, still stands proud. Of course, it was, the whole town was significantly damaged by the terrible earthquake in 2015, which many Gurkhas, of course, volunteered and did sterling work to help people who had been injured or made homeless. In the 18th century, however, a local ruler, Prithvi Narayan, decided to make himself master of everything he saw. He bought up a whole load of brown best muskets from the East India Company, and in 1742, uh, embarked after his father died and he became ruler, on a series of mini campaigns. And he was successful. He conquered the whole of what we now call uh, mm -hmm. and established his own kingdom. However, his successes found that they were balked in the north and east by the Chinese, the Chinese Empire, and balked in the south and west by British India, John Company, the Honorable East India Company. There were tensions between John Company and the Nepalese, the Gurkhas, which in November 1814 sparked into a war. These are many land disputes. Lord Moira, the Governor General, sent a force over 4,000 strong to um, subdue the Gurkhas and teach the Nepalese a lesson. The war lasted two years. It was a savage and murderous war. And by the end of it, although the British nominally claimed victory, it was, uh, it was a pretty close run thing. In reality, it was more of a stalemate. But the British soldiers, British and Indian Army soldiers, who were fighting in that war against the Gurkhas, uh, whom they hadn't really encountered previously, developed a tremendous respect for their adversaries. These tough, tenacious, and incredibly resilient mountain men put up a devil of a fight at each battle which they fought, and there were many. In one fight, which particularly impressed the British, whilst they were laying siege to uh, a, Gurkha, a Gurkha stockade, which had about 600 Gurkhas in it, who were, uh, in fact, being surrounded and attacked by over 4,000 British with me, artillery support. One Gurkha soldier within the fort who'd been injured, had his jaw broken by a bullet, actually came out under a flag of truce and asked if the local MO would kindly patch him up so he could go back and keep on fighting. And of course, being British, we did. When the war was over, the Kingdom of Nepal had to surrender a certain amount of territory, all of which has to be said they got back uh, after the end of the Indian mutiny. And yet, Lord Moira and his successors had realized that here, in this mountain country, there was a tremendous reservoir of formidable fighting men. And very quickly, John Company began to recruit Gurkhas. Initially, the British were not actually allowed to set up recruiting stations within the boundaries of the country itself, uh, but were able to send recruiting agents who persuaded young men to cross the frontier and to enlist. And that process, of young Gurkhas joining the British Army has continued for 200 years. But over this time, 
Johnny Gurkha has become embedded into the warp and weft of British military tradition. Then and now, the Gurkhas, uh, I will suggest, are as relevant to modern British tactical doctrine as they were in 1815. In this 200 years, the Gurkhas have served across a whole range of theatres. And I'll be running uh, in, in brief through these various theatres of operation later on in this talk. Perhaps no unit, no regiment or brigade serving with any other army, I would suggest, has experienced quite such a diversity of combat situations and indeed peacekeeping situations. We tend to think of the Gurkhas as being primarily a highly effective fighting force, which of course they are. And yet the Gurkhas have achieved a surprisingly high level of success in some very sensitive peacekeeping operations, particularly in Cyprus in 1974, when the Turks had invaded the island, of course, tensions between the Turkish invader and the native Cypriots were, to say the least, running very high. It was the Gurkhas who were effectively refereeing the dividing line between Cypriots and Turks, which did get very fraught. It was, however, their patience and firmness, it has to be said, that helped to uh, ameliorate what was, of course, a very, very difficult and dramatic and violent situation. Now, the Gurkha officer I was talking to summed up for me their ethos, which is uh, called Kaida, K-A-I-D-A. And I'll, I'll just read this if I may. He said, traditions matter. In themselves, they count for little, but they combine to form part of the identity that makes our regiment what it is. In our line of work, we have to do things that are far from normal. Our regiment provides us with some of the reference points that we need to bring sense into chaos. It is not easy to regain tradition once lost, so we must fight to keep it. It provides the framework for our relationships with one another and which in turn serve us well in peace and on operations. We should also be extremely proud to be part of the Royal Gurkha Rifles and a way of showing that pride is to uphold the traditions that our forebears established. This is Kaida. Our company Kaida is about family, F-A-M-I-L-Y, fitness, agility, mutual support, initiative, leadership, and you. But it's underpinned by our guiding principle of Kaida. History is like map reading. How do we know where we are if we do not know where we came from? And how, uh, how do we, how, how are we going to know where we're going if we don't know where we've been? I think that might be a very interesting mantra for the culture wars which we're busy fighting at the present time, where um, so many of it, so many of us seem wish to cancel our uh, particular culture and heritage and rewrite it, ideally to uh, a Marxist script. The first major campaign in which Gurkhas distinguished themselves and came particularly to the wider notice of British forces which are the course of the Indian mutiny. And I was thrown out of a museum in Liverpool for getting annoyed because the mutiny had been rebranded re the Indian First War of Independence. Apart from the dreadful syntax, I pointed out this was not the case. The mutiny was just that. It was an industrial dispute that got horribly out of hand uh, and led to a slew of atrocities being committed, as we said, by, by both sides. Nobody was, was guiltless. The British establishment in India was caught completely off guard by the eruption at Meerut of the rebellion, which quickly spread throughout um, the uh, governorship. The mutineers took Delhi and installed the last of the uh, Mughal emperors, to his great surprise, as an independent ruler of that part of India. Delhi was regarded as the crucible, as the most important center for both sides. If the British could recapture Delhi, then the rebellion would surely fail. If the mutineers, the rebels, could hang on to it, then there was a chance that they would prevail and drive out the British. Woefully underprepared, a small force of around 4,000 British troops took up a position on Delhi Ridge, just beyond the city. Now, the ridge was a very shallow ridge. It was bare. It was incredibly uh, sparse. There was very little cover except for a few buildings. And the mutineers who occupied the city itself were probably at least 10 times the number of the besieging force. The besiegers had few, uh, no heavy guns, and were not going to be able to make any impression against the walls until a large siege train could be brought up. The mutineers were aware 
that they needed to sweep the British off Delhi Ridge as quickly as possible. The main feature, the main built feature on the ridge was a large palazzo called Hindu Rao's house. Now, Hindu Rao was a wealthy merchant in Delhi who'd very wisely um, moved on to somewhere else for the course of the battle. And the British were able to occupy his very substantially built, rather blinged up sort of uh, palace. Not quite sure how you can explain the way it ended up to his insurers after the mutiny, but it formed the real bastion in virtually the center of the British line. And that was held by the second Gurkha battalion, who were then the CMO rifles, and they held it for three months. This was an Alamo and a Rourke Drift every day for three months. The mutineers perceived, rightly, that Hindu Rao's house was the key to the whole British position. They did have big guns, and the house was within the range of the mutineers' heavy artillery uh, on their Mori Bastion. Day after day, it was pounded by shells. By the end of the battle, the battalion uh, had suffered something in the order of 80% casualties. We know a great deal about what happened on the ridge because Major Reed, who was commanding at the time, left uh, a very, very detailed day-by-day -day account of the siege. Time and again, the mutineers sallied out in an attempt to take Hindu Rao's house and were seen off by the Gurkhas, by the Gurkhas and, and the British rifles as well. And this association between the Gurkhas and the rifles uh, was cemented by the, uh, their joint heroism in defending Hindu Rao's house. The attacks were pressed home on a daily basis with overwhelming numbers, overwhelming superior firepower. And yet time and again, the Gurkhas threw them back using cookeries, bayonets, and their rifles. They were armed with rifles, not muskets. And any time the mutinies actually took one of the uh, smaller buildings lying out on the plain, the Gurkhas would counterattack, often against uh, huge odds, and retake it. Eventually, as the pendulum began to swing, and the British presence on the ridge stiffened as the big guns came up, as legendary characters like John Nicholson joined the siege. It came time, in due course, to storm Delhi, of course, the famous storming of Delhi, blowing of the Kashmir Gate, in which the Gurkhas more than played their part. It was a hard and bloody job. Reed himself was actually, whose luck finally ran out during the attack, and he himself was, uh, was severely injured. But the Gurkhas had more than proved themselves. They had proved that they were firstly loyal to the British crown, they were not infected by the spirit of mutiny, although there were many attempts by the mutineers to entice the Gurkha soldiers into the mutineer camp, uh, they remained adamant that they were loyal. The then ruler of Nepal took the opportunity to send in a large number of Nepalese soldiers to support the, to support the Raj, for which he got back all the territory which had been lost in the earlier Gurkha war. And this pretty much set the pattern for Gurkha activity on the subcontinent. The Northwest Frontier and Afghanistan were areas that would become very familiar to successive generations of Gurkhas, including, of course, uh, my son-in-law's soldiers from 2RGR in the course of Operation Herrick, various uh, stages of Operation Herrick. The Gurkhas were fortunate in that they had not been involved in the first Afghan war, which, of course, ended in uh, disaster in 1842. They were, however, heavily involved in the second Afghan war in 1879, where they performed tremendous feats of endurance. And that was one of the aspects of the Gurkha, which always impressed the British, was their physical endurance. When the heavy guns had to be dragged across Afghanistan's plains, uh, the oxen collapsed. The heat was so, heat and dehydration meant that the oxen collapsed. So the Gurkhas had to pull the guns. The Gurkhas literally manhandled the guns and they didn't collapse and they covered themselves in glory. They were back, of course, again in the Tira campaign in 1897. And the Kandahar gun is still one of their particularly uh, treasured relics of that campaign. This was the time when they charged the infamous Dargai Heights with the Gordons, which again cemented another close relationship between the Gordon Highlanders and the Gurkhas. Indeed, it was always said there was a kind of precedent with the Highlanders from which the Gurkhas benefited in terms of their being recruited. After Culloden in 1746, the Hanoverian government, the British government, had uh, come down very hard on the recusant or Tory clans. But 10 years later, Pitt the Elder had a brilliant idea. Rather than being suspicious of all these fit, able-bodied young men, rather restless young men in the Scotch glens, let's recruit them. Let's get them into red coats the uh, wars in America, the Seven Years' War in America, which is about to kick off. And of course, Scottish regiments 
Highland regiments covered themselves in glory in the course of those campaigns. And the links between the Highland regiments and the Gurkhas remain, remain fixed even to this day. And the Highlanders um, blessed the Gurkhas with their most powerful cultural icon, the bagpipes. The Gurkhas today have their own pipers. Um, now, I have no idea what view people take on the bagpipes, but that could be a curse or a blessing, depending on how you, how you see it. But the Gurkhas certainly are, uh, are enthusiastic pipers. And my, when my daughter married my son-in-law, they were piped out of the church by, uh, by the Gurkha pipes. And if you like that sort of thing, they are very good pipers. The Gurkhas, having uh, fought in 1879 and fought again in 1897, were back in Afghanistan stand for the third Afghan war in 1919. It's the one we tend to forget about. This was an occasion where it was actually the Afghans who attacked. It was the Afghans who uh, attacked British uh, possessions on the northwest frontier. And the Gurkhas are part of the force which was sent in to stop their incursions and drive them out, which in due course they, they did. The northwest frontier never went away. It simmered. It was, it reminds me of the Anglo-Scottish frontier during the, the border wars. There was always low level asymmetric conflict going on with the local tribes. It's what they did. The tribes had been used to coming down out of the hills and raiding pretty much at will on the uh, farmlands uh, in the Indus Valley. The fact the British put a stop to that didn't, didn't go down at all well. And the Gurkhas were heavily involved in this active policing. This is a pretty dangerous and hairy business, it has to be said. Um, one officer who served with the Gurkhas, of course, who left a very interesting literary account of his time was John Masters, the author of Nightmares of Bengal, Bawani Junction, uh, a celebrated novelist after the war. He joined, I think he was fourth Gurkha, he joined in 1937, served with them all the way through the war. His three volume uh, autobiography uh, of his time with the Gurkhas is, uh, is an exceptionally good record of that time. And of course, the, the Gurkhas in a way embody the spirit of the Raj, uh, if, if the Gurkhas hadn't exist, had, did not exist, then Kipling would probably have to have created them. They were the perfect native force to support this image of the Raj. And of course, that's very unfashionable today. The idea of empire is indeed uh, very unfashionable. But the Gurkhas more than did their bit during their, their long time of service in India. One of the more remarkable campaigns in which the Gurkhas were heavily involved, was the invasion of Tibet in 1904, uh, led by Colonel Young Husband. Now, like many British imperial adventures along the northwest, or in this case, northeast frontier, military action was sparked by fear of Russian intentions. This was a time of the great game, the 19th century. It was this period when Britain and Russia were dueling across the roof of the world as to who would be top dog along the roof of the world. Britain had deep-seated fears about Russian imperial ambitions on India, uh, which was a main cause, certainly, of several of the uh, our excursions into Afghanistan. Same thing happened in 1904, when it was feared that the Russians were making overtures to the uh, highly mysterious and secretive regime in Lhasa, uh, a country uh, in which Britain said, very few Britons had ever been there. It was this wonderful Shangri-La land of, of mystery. So deep did these fears strike that young husband, only a colonel, was given a mission to go to Lhasa to make representations to the government. Um, they didn't ask him to go. In fact, they'd rather he didn't go. And therefore, the expedition to Lhasa was effectively an invasion. Uh, Tibetans, perhaps not entirely unreasonably, resisted. Um, they had pretty primitive weapons. But of course, this, this campaign was fought at a starching high altitude. And the Gurkhas actually fought a battle at 18,000 feet. They climbed above to outflank a, a fortified ravine held by Tibetan uh, musketeers, smoothbore weapons, and were actually fighting over ground where the Tibetans themselves found it very difficult to breathe. The Gurkhas, in all their kit with no oxygen, nothing, no, uh, no mechanical aids, uh, climbed the cliffs attaining this height of 18,000 feet, outflanked the uh, position, fired down into them, and the Tibetans abandoned the position and retreated. Gurkhas took part in a number of actions in Tibet. Uh, there was some concern expressed latterly when a large number of Tibetan and uh, religious antiquities appeared at Christie's auction house in London a few weeks later. So there was um, a fair bit of booty taken, has to be said. 
until the expedition did eventually reach Lhasa, Lhasa and um, make whatever representations we needed to make before withdrawing. As far as I'm aware, I can't think of another army or unit which has fought a major battle at a higher altitude than 18,000 feet, certainly uh, without, without oxygen. The major sea change for the Gurkhas, something which way beyond their previous experience, was in 1914 to 1980. When the war in Europe, when the Western Front exploded in the late summer of 1914, British troops holding their ground on the Western Front, especially after the establishment of the trench line and the First Battle of Ypres, found themselves under immense pressure. The Germans were numerically superior. They had far better uh, trench weapons than we did. They had better mortars, they had grenades. We didn't have grenades. And therefore, an Indian Army Corps was rushed in, almost literally parachuted, into the fight on the Western Front. Now, if you're a young man from Nepal, who, until he joined the British Army, has now been out of his remote mountain village, to be transported thousands of miles by ship, of course, these Gurkhas had never seen a ship before. They'd never seen an ocean before. To be transported such a vast distance to uh, the south of France, to Marseille, uh, where they had to, they got an enthusiastic welcome, but they were then thrown into war on the Western Front with absolutely no acclimatization, no preparation, and no winter clothing. They were fighting in December, November and December on the Western Front, wearing the same uniforms as they'd left in Union. They had very few machine guns, they had no grenades, they had no trench mortars, and they lacked close quarter uh, 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 light field guns for close quarter support. In spite of that, the Gurkhas fought some astonishing actions on the Western Front, very costly actions, has to be said. Never were they beaten. Never were they driven off their ground. The casualties individual battalion suffered uh, was tremendous. They were still on the Western Front in 1915 and took part in the Second Battle of Ypres, where the Germans attempted in beginning in April and using poison gas for the first time to drive or to shrink pinch out the Ypres salient. There's no point in them trying to pinch out the Ypres salient. No more than any point in us trying to hang on to it. Because first of all, generals were obsessed with taking and holding ground. The Gurkhas, uh, Gurkha, the brigade of Gurkhas, three battalions who were serving, actually took part in an attack on Mauser Ridge in April, which had happened in April 1940. Now I walked the ground, still walked most of the ground at Ypres. And what is astonishing, not that ultimately the attack failed, but that anybody actually managed to get up to the German trenches. Ground couldn't have been more difficult. It was swept by fire. It was a time when the Brits really hadn't learned, we had not learned the finer arts of trench warfare, not to the degree which the Germans had. And yet the Gurkhas, despite appalling losses, uh, continued. They also fought at Luce, where uh, battalion was literally wiped out in defense. Thereafter, they were moved, the, the, the Indian Army uh, Corps was moved to the Middle East to fight in uh, Palestine to fight against the, the Turks. And once again, the Gurkhas were, as ever, at the forefront of the fighting in the long and bloody drawn out battles of Gaza before the uh, British forces under Allenby were finally victorious. The last great battle was Armageddon, which seems that uh, fought at Armageddon, which seems pretty appropriate. The Indian Army Corps had uh, covered itself in glory, had won a number of uh, Victoria Crosses. And of course, had suffered uh, very heavy casualties. The losses suffered by the Indian Army Corps, and it had to be said, the in many cases, the uh, incompetent manner in which they had been deployed, uh, were prime movers in stimulating the uh, mood for Indian independence, uh, which had begun to grow and grew, of course, in the space between the wars, and then finally uh, erupted in terrible ethnic violence in 1947. Between the wars. The Gurkhas fought extensively, again, as I mentioned, on the northwest frontier. Not major battles, but small, steady, ghastly battles of attrition, fighting against the Patans, the native tribes, who were inured to war, tremendous fighters, tremendously courageous, tremendously skilled, and uh, infinitely subtle in their tactics. This was a very, very tough school, training school for the Gurkhas. The the tribes in northwest frontier, the Pashtuns, were uh, fighting was their business. That's what they did. If they weren't fighting the British, they, they would fight each other. The, the tribes fought each other. And the harsh and unrelenting landscape was indeed a very tough finishing school. Once again, the Gurkhas were able to cover themselves with, with honor, with glory.
And yet perhaps in all of their long history, the major test for the Gurkhas was the Second World War. And of course that war, uh, the Gurkha units would serve with great distinction on the Western Front, Sicily, Italy, and of course in the war during the course of the war in Burma. In 1914, when Britain stood alone, uh, there was some question as to whether the King of Nepal would allow fresh Gurkhas to be recruited. In fact, in the course of the war, over, uh, there were something like 40 odd battalions of Gurkhas were raised. And without the Gurkhas, I think it's fair to say the Battle for Burma, uh, we would have struggled to win the Battle for Burma. The Gurkhas were a major factor in the final Allied success in Burma. The King of Nepal at the time was wholly supportive. The long association between the British and the Nepalese um, bore fruit. And he was more than happy for additional young men to be recruited to fight in Allied armies. Uh, Nepal in 1940 was just about the only ally Britain had left uh, at that point. One of the the most celebrated battles which the Gurkhas fought in the course of the Italian campaign uh, was the aptly named Hangman's Hill. It's called Hangman's Hill because apparently it was a, a telegraph pole that uh, was sort of leaning over at a rather suggestive angle, looked horribly like a gallows. Uh, this, was, um, this wasn't entirely unfitting because the Hangman Hill was a pimple uh, which stood stands just below the Massif of Monte Cassino. Now, in late 1943, early 1944, the Allies were butting up on the western side of the Italian peninsula against the Gustav Line. And German forces were under the um, very able command of Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, Smiling Albert, as he was known. Though it was the American Fifth Army which were pushing up, the objective was to cross the Rapido and Gagliano rivers and then drive on to Rome. In the way, apart from the fact the rivers crossing were contested, was this great massive town and then the Benedictine Abbey on the mountainside above of Monte Cassino. Kesselring, who was a lay brother of the Benedictine Order, had actually given General Alexander a personal assurance that German troops would not ever occupy the monastery itself. Nonetheless, uh, the American General Mark Clark, who I say was universally detested by every British soldier I ever interviewed who served in Norway, uh, served in Italy, including several members of my own family, ordered that the monastery be bombed, uh, which led to a furious telephone call from Kesselring to uh, Alexander, protesting that there was no need for this. And he had given his word as a German officer. However, once the monastery was flattened, um, Kesselring turned it into a fortress. His Fashimio, his elite paratroopers, who were the cream of the German army, were, or certainly cream of the Luftwaffe, were digging and burrowing into the remains of both the town and the monastery to create what effectively was an impregnable fortress. Early battles trying to push a path across the Rapido in January and February 1944, stalled pretty disastrously for both the British and the Americans. French mountain, mountain troops, Goumier, managed to claw quite literally a path around to outflank each other positions. And then it was a head-on assault against Casino. The British and American forces again attempted to scale the heights around the monastery and to take the ruined monastery. All efforts were rebuffed. Paratroopers were well dug in they were highly efficient, uh, highly experienced soldiers who certainly were not going to give up the ground uh, at all easily. General Tuka and the 4th Indian Division were brought in to spearhead a new offensive. Fortunately, Tuka himself uh, was quite seriously ill at this time, had to be kazabacked out, and General Bernard Freyberg, a Kiwi, a um, highly decorated soldier who commanded in Crete and had commanded the Kiwi Division throughout the Desert War, tremendous great fighting man, uh, Freiburg, one of EC in the First World War. And then the 20s at a country house party, Churchill bid him strip his sleeve and show his scars. Churchill liked to be a war hero, and, and, and Freiburg was covered in scar tissue from the many, many wounds he'd suffered in the course of the Great War. Uh, so Freiburg was the, the fighting general who was leading the troops at Monte Cassino. Fortunately, unlike Tuca, Freiburg wasn't a particularly subtle strategist. Tuca had favored a peripheral strategy going around the monastery pinching out the salient on which it stood, whereas Freiburg decided to kick in the front door. Hangman Hill stood directly in front of the monastery. To the right, that is to the east, was Castle Hill, and above that was Snake Ridge. Attacks on all of these had been stalled. There were three Gurkha battalions that had been used in these earlier attacks, but the ground in front of the monastery, when you fought your way down from Snake Ridge, was completely bare and exposed. German guns were zeroed in on every inch of it. There was very little cover 
what little cover there was, was heavily mined. Daytime attacks, nighttime attacks were all repulsed with significant casualties. The job of taking Hangman's Hill, in fact, it was the front door to the monastery, fell to 1st 9th Battalion. And it was in uh, middle of February when they fought their way, clawed their way up the slope. Only C Company actually managed to make it initially onto the top of the pimple and saw a significant German counterattack, by which time the rest of the battalion had come up and dug in. Dug in under intense German fire. The Hangman Hill wasn't really a springboard to attack the monastery. The whole position was covered by German guns. But the Gurkhas hung on. They hung on for 16 days on the top of that hill, swept by fire with casualties mounting on a daily basis. Communication, supply, evacuation of wounded were virtually impossible in daylight hours. Supplies had to be airdropped in, of course, because it was such a narrow plateau. Many of the containers uh, actually fell uh, to the Germans, which we were very grateful for, and not to the beleaguered Gurkhas. But they held their position for 16 days until, under cover of darkness, they were finally withdrawn. First, ninth Gurkhas had started out with a full company, a full complement of about 900 men. By the time they came down from Hangman's Hill, there were eight officers and 177 men still on their feet. There's, there's a huge carved builder on top of Hangman Hill, if you ever go to, but you can see enough, into which the badge of the ninth Gurkha rifles is incised. The Gurkhas served throughout the whole of the campaign in the Far East, as I mentioned. They served in distinction uh, during the ghastly retreat, uh, retreat from Burma as a Japanese uh, pressure mounted in Exeter in 1942. They dug in on the borders of India in Assam in 1943 and then took part in the great battles of Kohima and Imphal at the start in 1944, which marked the high water mark of Japanese aggression in Assam. The Japanese onslaught was stopped. Uh, the Japanese suffered enormous casualties, as indeed did the British. And uh, quite literally, at one point, the, the crucible of the battle was the, well, the, the local district officers' tennis court. Japanese on one side, our guys on the other. Kukris versus um, Japanese katanas. We won, or the Gurkhas won. At some cost, it had to be said. And the Gurkhas then marched the slim all the way down through Burma in his brilliant campaign to recover the ground from the Japanese. And when the borders of Malaya, when the um, Japanese finally uh, surrendered. Surprisingly, there were actually Gurkha, para the, the Gurkha parachute battalions were involved in some of the latter stages. There was always this argument as to whether the Gurkhas qualified as special forces. Gurkha soldiers had taken part in both the first and second Chindit operation. They were not popular with their commander, Ord Wingate. He didn't like the Gurkhas, and to be fair, they didn't like him. A Wingate tended to split the Gurkha units up into relatively smaller pockets and assign them to other units. This is not the way the Gurkhas like to fight. The Gurkhas are a family. They need to be with their comrades. It's, it is a tribal thing. Uh, and Wingate was less than complimentary about the Gurkhas. I have to say they were generally less than complimentary about Wingate. Nonetheless, the parachute battalions, when they were formed, when volunteers were called for, and there was a meeting held with the, the many NCOs who volunteered to join these parachute battalions, and the Gurkhas looked a bit wary, a bit windy. And this is a way we're expected to, to jump out of, out of aircraft. Yes, you can jump out of aircraft and fight on the ground. Eventually, they all agreed. What they hadn't realized, what the, the parachute officer addressed hadn't realized, the Gurkhas hadn't realized they were going to get parachutes. They thought they were just expected to jump out of aircraft at a height, land in trees, uh, make their way to the ground, and then start fighting. And in spite of all that, they were still up for it. So this has produced an argument which has been put forward by various correspondents, various writers, some distinguished writers, who have always said the Gurkhas are special forces. Now, I personally tend to disagree with that. I do not see the Gurkhas specifically as special forces in the way that commandos, special air service, etc., are special forces. I see special forces as relatively small detachments of highly trained men who operate exclusively behind enemy lines, often not subject to direct day-to-day -day control. The Gurkhas don't do that. The Gurkhas are regular soldiers. They fight in regular units, and they obviously take their orders in the usual way. However, Johnny Gurkha, over his 200 years of service with the British Army, has proved to be incredibly adaptable. In fact, compared to jump out of a plane without a parachute, that suggests certainly a, a certain, um, certain sang-froid, if nothing else. And their particular skills 
have led to the battery being deployed in special forces roles, but I don't think that's quite the same as being special forces. Now, of course, in 1947, the partition of India took place, which was uh, turned into a, an absolute bloodbath of sectarian violence. And this is one of the instances where the Gurkha troops, were very few Gurkhas, very few British troops, in fact, in India, who were able to do anything to try and prevent or at least moderate the level of violence that was going on. The Gurkhas proved highly effective, again, in a peacekeeping role, in keeping a gap between the warring factions, in protecting refugees, in acting in a very much a peacekeeping and relief situation. And they carried that through to, again, as I mentioned, to situations like Cyprus in 1974. But after the war, the Gurkhas, of course, served, they served in uh, the long anti uh, counterinsurgency campaign in Malaya and again in Borneo, the rather lesser known uh, battlefield in Borneo in 1965. And the campaign in Malaya went on from 1948 to 1960, a long drawn out campaign, and has since served really as the blueprint for successful counter insurgency operations. It was a long drawn out and costly fight and tied down an awful lot of men, but the, the enemy, this communist terrorist, the CTs, were beaten. And these were tough indigenous fighters who knew what they were about and knew the ground over which they fought. And yet the Gurkhas, along with other British forces, the SAS was revived to fight in Malaya. Nonetheless, were successful in beating the CTs at their own game. The Gurkhas became very adept at patrolling, very adept, because many of them had served in Burma, so they, they already had the necessary jungle fighting skills. And Gurkhas were a major element in the successful deployment of British forces, which brought Malaya to a successful conclusion. Interestingly enough, our American allies asked uh, for a blueprint uh, for uh, the campaign in Malaya because they thought they could translate that to Vietnam. Uh, the lesson being that firstly, uh, that no one campaign is ever quite like another. And secondly, um, I wouldn't necessarily trust the Americans with that level of tactical doctrine. It's just a bit too subtle, I think, for our American. Gurkhas, of course, also served, served, have a long association with Hong Kong. And again, there was a strong peacekeeping element to their role in Hong Kong in deterring um, the more aggressive elements of the Chinese People's Army from crossing the frontier and uh, wreaking havoc. Gurkhas were deployed in the Falklands. It was said, truly, truthfully or otherwise, that once the Argentine forces uh, became aware that Gurkhas were being deployed against them in the South Atlantic, that was one of the prime who was uh, determining them in, in their surrender. Now, I'm not sure if that's true, but there was a whole lot of hysterical press articles in the Argentinian press about the, the Los Barbaros Gurkhas, these Gurkha barbarians who were going to come and cut heads off uh, any Argentinians that they happened to come across. And if you think about it, it's an awfully long way from Kathmandu to Port Stanley. I doubt any unit in history has, not even, I can't think of any force in history that fought over so long a period across such a huge range of differing uh, geographic regions and climates. And of course, most recently, the Gurkhas have fought uh, in Afghanistan, in the uh, Operation Eric, British deployment in Afghanistan from 2001 to 2014. I think it's fair to say that as long as Britain wishes to maintain a capacity for expeditionary warfare, and I see no reason at the moment to suggest that we will not maintain that capacity, then the Gurkhas will be an integral part of that. They will be a valuable and valued part of that role. And I'm sure will continue as ever to do good service to Britain and of course to the world community.